Good morning and thank you for joining me for our Lord's Day message from God's Word. Uh, Before we get into the Word, I'm going to take a moment to pray. So wherever you're watching this, please join with me and let's go together to our Heavenly Father. Uh, Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, thank you for loving us so well. Thank you for meeting all of our needs. Thank you for your Word your church, your spirit, and your son. Thank you for forgiveness of sins and everlasting life in him. Please be merciful to your children who are struggling with fatigue, with frustration, and with fear. Please give peace to those who are anxious, strength to those who are faltering, and joy to those who are discouraged. Please minister your grace to us right now by the preaching of your word. Open our eyes that we may behold marvellous things. And this we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. I thought it might be good to take a little break from our study through the Gospel according to Luke and consider a portion of Scripture from the Old Testament. I've chosen a text that is familiar to many of you, uh, a text that might have a special place in your heart. Uh, Psalm 46. I invite you to follow along as I read it aloud and perhaps you'd like to read aloud with me. Psalm 46. To the chief musician for the sons of Korah, the song upon Alamoth. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. The heathen raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. I want to begin this morning by talking about our feelings. And we love doing that, don't we? (laughs) Now, I'm not referring to our immediate emotional responses. I'm referring to that which we feel deeper down and for extended periods of time. Maybe feelings isn't the right word, but uh, I couldn't find a better one. Now we talk about feeling calm or feeling angry or feeling discouraged. It's something below the surface of our moment by moment responses. Now it's true that we can feel a certain way, but project with our words and with our body language something quite different. I think men especially are very good at this. We can look to others as if we're confident and secure and happy, but inside we're a mess and we don't like to admit it. Now, Why I mention this is because there are feelings being expressed in the words of this psalm. It's not simply an outline of certain theological propositions. Uh, We don't read this as if it were an academic lecture or the confessional statement of a church. Uh, We read this as a poem, as a song, because that's what it is. And therefore we read it with feeling, we read it with passion. 
Now God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Now the psalmist has written these words because he doesn't just believe them, he senses the truth of them very deeply in his soul. For want of a better expression, he feels them to be so. His inner life has been touched and shaped by these truths about God. This song is an expression of his confidence and his assurance. He is not afraid. And he won't be afraid because he knows deep down within his soul that God is his refuge and his strength, a very present help when trouble comes. And here's the question that I want us to think about this morning. How do we get to where the psalmist was when he penned these words? Now we can read texts like this and believe the theological propositions they set forth. In other words, we can believe, uh, we can affirm the things they say about God. We believe that God is powerful. We believe that God is wise, that God is in control. We believe that God loves us, uh, that God will help us and so forth. But these truths don't always seem to filter down into our soul. They don't seem to affect our inner life. We don't feel these things to be so. We read them, we affirm them, and yet we're unaffected. To use the words before us today, we believe that God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble, and yet we are afraid. We are worried. We are struggling to be hopeful. We find ourselves discouraged or overwhelmed. Maybe this is something you experience often. The words on the pages of Holy Scripture, words that you believe, don't seem to actually affect you. How do we get to where the psalmist was? Well, I think the psalmist tells us how. And there are two parts to it. We find them at the end of the song, but to appreciate them we have to follow the movement of the psalm as a whole. It's divided into three stanzas. Each concludes with a pause, uh, with the word selah. As we've seen, it begins with a bold confession of faith. Because God is our refuge and strength, we will not be afraid, even if the worst possible things were to happen. Mountains carried off into the sea, oceans roaring, the earth shaking. It's quite a picture of calamity and disaster. Now Spurgeon explains it this way. The psalmist sets forth the most terrible commotions within the range of the imagination. This includes the overthrow of dynasties, the destruction of nations, the ruin of families, the persecution of the church, the reign of heresy, and whatever else may at any time try the faith of believers. And then further down he says, Alps and Andes may tremble, but faith rests on a firmer basis and is not moved by swelling seas. Evil may ferment, wrath may boil, and pride may foam, but the brave heart of holy confidence trembles not. Great men, who are like mountains, may quake for fear in times of great calamity, but the man whose trust is in God needs never be dismayed. This is what we see in the opening stanza of this song, verses 1 to 3. And then the tone changes markedly in the opening lines of the second stanza. We move from the world in turmoil to the city of God. And it is at peace because God is in the midst of her and his grace is flowing. Verses 4 and 5. There is a river 
the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. And we could have a whole sermon unpacking the metaphors in these verses. Uh, the psalmist has Jerusalem in view, but we can also see this as referring to the people of God in every age. This picture of a river is so rich with meaning. It's a figure we see through the Old Testament and on into the New Testament. It's the waters of Shiloh that go softly in Isaiah chapter 8. It's the fountain of living water in Jeremiah chapter 2. It's the water that Jesus gives in John chapter 4, a stream of grace and blessing from which God's people are sustained and refresh themselves. And God himself is in the midst of this city. In the temple in Jerusalem under the old covenant and in every place under the new covenant by his spirit, his people are the temple. God is with his people. They shall not be moved. They won't be shaken. God will help them. God will protect them. And in the next two verses of this second stanza, God's protection and his power are described. Verse 6, the heathen raged, the kingdoms were moved, he uttered his voice, the earth melted. Verse 7, the Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. The psalmist refers to the Lord of hosts, the Lord who is captain of the army of heaven, the Lord who leads the host of mighty warrior angels into battle. This is the person who Joshua met when he led Israel into its promised land. This is the host that Jacob saw in Genesis chapter 32. This is the host that Elisha saw in 2 Kings chapter 6. Uh, he was surrounded by the Syrian army, but that army was surrounded by the Lord's army. The mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire. The Lord of hosts is with his people. Now, verse 6 is a poetic description of the success the Lord had given his people over their enemies. When the psalmist looks back, he sees one remarkable victory after another. The heathen came against God's people. They came in all of their fury and rage, and it's as if God simply spoke a word. They were defeated. They melted away. Again, listen to Spurgeon's commentary. He says, The nations were in a furious uproar. They gathered against the city of the Lord like wolves, ravenous for their prey. They foamed and roared and swelled like a tempestuous sea. With no other instrumentality than a word, the Lord ruled the storm. He gave forth a voice, and stout hearts were dissolved, proud armies were annihilated, conquering powers were enfeebled. When the element of divine power came into view, the very earth seemed turned to wax. The most solid, substantial of human things melted like the fat of rams upon the altar. The rage of man subsided. subsided. How mighty is a word from God. And this leads us then to the third and final stanza of the psalm, verses 8 to 11. And it's here we have the answer to our question. How do we get to where the psalmist was when he penned these words. I want to feel like the psalmist did when he wrote this song, don't you? Uh, I want this same confidence. I want this same assurance. I want to be able to say, I am not afraid, and I won't be afraid, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be cast into the midst of the sea. How do we get to this place wherein we don't just possess the truth, but the truth possesses us and changes us inwardly. 
as I said, there are two parts to it. The first is given to us in verse 8, and the second in verse 10. And they can be summarised this way. Behold and be still. Verse 8. Come, behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. The tone of the song shifts again. In the first stanza, the psalmist is confessing with God's people. Now, we will not fear. In the second stanza, he is comf comforting God's people. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God. God is in the midst of her. And now in the third stanza, he is calling God's people, calling them to do some things. He implores his readers, come, behold the works of the Lord. And the Hebrew word translated behold uh, means more than just a brief glance. It means more than just a cursory look. It means to gaze at and by extension to contemplate. Uh, the sense here is something like this. Perceive the works of the Lord. Observe them well. Think about them. And it's interesting the works that the psalmist calls God's people to behold. Verse 6. What desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. These are works of judgment. This is kingdoms and nations being put down. This is God overthrowing the armies of men. These works represent his sovereignty over the kingdoms of this world. The psalmist calls his readers to see in the grand sweep of history the works of the Lord. And in the immediate context, he is calling them to see this with special reference to their own nation. The Lord broke bows and shattered spears and burned chariots on behalf of his people Israel to protect them from their enemies. Forgive me for quoting Spurgeon for a third time, but he seems to sum things up so well. He says, whenever we read history, it should be with this verse sounding in our ears. We should read the newspaper in the same spirit to see how the head of the church rules the nations for his people's good as Joseph governed Egypt for the sake of Israel. The destroyers he destroys the desolators he desolates. How forcible is the verse at this date. The ruined cities of Assyria, Babylon, Petra, Bashan, Canaan are our instructors. And in tables of stone record the doings of the Lord. This is how the children of Israel would be able to say with the psalmist, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble, therefore will not we fear. This was the first part. It was by beholding the works of the Lord. By looking back through their history to see God at work, protecting them and providing for them. By looking back and seeing him put down those nations that came against them. By seeing and contemplating the many examples of his power and his wisdom and his love, their hearts would be changed, filled with peace, filled with confidence and filled with hope. And brothers and sisters, this is the first part of it for us. If we want our inner life to be affected by the truths we say we believe, we too must behold the works of the Lord. We have to be in the habit of seeing those truths illustrated in God's dealings with the world, with his people, and with us as individuals. 
We have to spend time looking at the works of the Lord in the scriptures, in creation, and in the ongoing exercise of providence. We have to see his works and think about them, ponder them, meditate on them. Something that has been a bit of a theme for me over the last couple of years, and I'm sure it's come through in my preaching, is seeing the works of the Lord in creation. I'm learning to ponder what I see around me and let it take me to where God intends for it to take me, and that is to himself. And it has done wonders for my soul, for for my inner life. And it's there for all of us. The morning light, the lily white, declare their maker's praise. This is our Father's world. He shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass we can hear him pass. He speaks to us everywhere. Now we might believe certain things about a person, and sincerely so. But it makes a difference when we see them behave that way, doesn't it? I might believe that my friend is gracious or wise or strong. I've heard that from other people. Uh, That's the vibe I get when I'm around him. But something happens when I actually witness him be gracious or wise or strong. When I see him behave in these ways towards someone else or towards me. My belief is strengthened. It is more deeply held. I'm not a huge fan of this expression, but when I see my friend behave that way, my beliefs about him move from my head to my heart. The same thing happens when we see the works of the Lord. Now we are very good at uh, beholding all kinds of things. Uh, We're very good at beholding our mobile phone screen. Many of us are experts. Uh, We can spend hours looking at it every day, no trouble at all. We're very good at beholding Facebook and Instagram. We're very good at beholding the television. We We pay close attention to our bank accounts and to our favorite online shopping sites. Uh, We've become quite adept at looking at Netflix and Disney Plus and YouTube and a thousand other things. And I'm not criticizing that at all. I simply make the point that we're always, always going to feel a deficit in our soul if we don't take time to behold the works of the Lord in creation, in Christ, and especially in the cross. The first three verses of this psalm and the hundreds of verses like them in the Bible, verses that we believe, will not resonate with us. We won't feel the truth of them inwardly. We won't be affected by them like we wish we were if we won't do this. If we won't take time every day to behold the works of the Lord. So that's the first part. We need to behold And then secondly, we need to be still. Now this is the line in this psalm that we're probably most familiar with. Verse 10, be still and know that I am God. Now I have to say that I don't think the popular Christian understanding of this verse is quite right. Uh, You might see it on a greeting card or in a, a lovely graphic on Pinterest or Facebook. And what people tend to have in mind is someone sitting quietly by themselves, watching a sunset and having wonderful thoughts about God. Or they think of someone sitting quietly with their Bible and their coffee in some kind of meditative state. Uh, There is an almost new age sentiment that some people bring to this verse. We need to be still. We need to centre ourselves. But that's not what's in view. A better picture of what is being expressed here is to imagine a three-year-old child that is being loud and boisterous and running around the house, causing mayhem. A child who is oblivious to their parents. And mum and dad comes along and gently yet firmly holds that child and says, Be still. 
That's what God is saying here to us. It's, it's that kind of stillness. It's more like, stop and listen to me. Recognise who I am and who you are. Now this is about acknowledging God as God. Not fighting against him. Not resisting him. Not ignoring him. But submitting to him. But one translation puts it this way. Desist and know that I am God. Another puts it this way, be silent and stop your striving and know that I am God. This idea of submission is borne out by what we read in the second half of the verse. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Those who don't know God those who resist God will end up exalting him. The, the whole earth will do that. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. So do it now, the psalmist says. Do it voluntarily. Be still and know that he is God. And Matthew Henry puts it this way in his commentary. As I said, I don't think this is the popular understanding of this verse, but it's the correct one. He writes, Let his enemies be still and threaten no more, but know it to their terror that he is God, one infinitely above them. Let them rage no more, for it is all in vain. He that sits in heaven laughs at them, and in spite of all their impotent malice against his name and honour, he will be exalted among the heathen, and not merely among his own people. He will be exalted in the earth, and not merely in the church. Men will set up themselves, will have their own way and do their own will, but let them know that God will be exalted. He will have his way, he will do his own will, he will glorify his own name. And wherein they deal proudly, he will be above them, and make them know that he is so. And this is the message for those who resist the Lord. They need to stop. They need to know him and yield to him. And it's the same message for those who are part of his kingdom. We need to be still in the sense that we need to stop trying to go our own way. We need to stop trying to do our own thing and hoping that God will go along with us and lend us a hand every now and again. And we need to stop being stirred up about circumstances over which we have no control and instead submit ourselves to God and to his will. Acknowledge that he is God and we are not and as such he can do with this world and with our lives whatsoever he pleases. If we really would be still that would make such a difference. I've told this story before, but it's worth sharing again to illustrate this point. Uh, in the weeks immediately prior to the birth of my first child, uh, I, I was very anxious. Anxious about the birth. Anxious about all the things that could possibly go wrong. I, I became very fearful and troubled. And I remember one day going into an upstairs bedroom in the little townhouse in which we were living at that time and literally getting down before the Lord with my face on the carpet and acknowledging that God was God, that he was sovereign over my life and he had every right to do as he pleased with my wife and with my unborn child. I yielded myself and the situation to him and I expressed my trust in him as weak and as frail as it was. Looking back, that was me being still and knowing that he is God. And when I got to that place, I finally had some peace. The Lord comforted me and assured me what I believed in my mind, I felt in my soul, and I was okay. I found myself having to do this quite often over the last 18 months. As we well know, this is a season of difficulty and disruption. 
It's easy to become anxious and fearful. It's easy to become frustrated and despondent. It's easy to become bitter and angry. At various times I've had to stop and know that He is God. I confess that He is sovereign over all things except the circumstances that I find myself in and trust Him. And I'm sure I'm not alone in this. Perhaps this is something that you need to do today. You need to take some time to get before the Lord. Maybe right down on your face. You need to humble yourself and acknowledge his sovereignty. You need to yield your anxious, fearful, frustrated heart to him. Now we want to experience inwardly the blessings of our salvation. We want to experience the peace and the joy and the confidence that is ours in Christ. We want the truths we believe, the truths that are described in Psalms like this one, to filter down into our soul, to affect us. We want to feel them to be so. So how do we get there? How do we get to where the psalmist was when he penned these wonderful words? We get there by taking some time every day to behold the works of the Lord and by being still and knowing that he is God. Behold and be still. See him at work and submit to his will. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. May his peace, a peace which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen.